stay home for a while. His air group had completed its carrier tour and was now based ashore at North Island. With this good chance in mind, we bought a car. In it, we took advantage of some of the recreational facilities. Swimming at the beach. And tennis. On a Saturday or Sunday, we sometimes visited a Navy club. But much of our leisure time was devoted to Fred's study, which would set him in line for promotion to Petty Officer Second Class. He'd begun to study on board his ship and was now boning hard for the soon-to-come examination. I knew he wanted the promotion, so I not only encouraged him to study, but also helped him in whatever way I could. Fred got his promotion. And I was very, very proud of him. One morning, a couple of months later, Something wrong, what is it? <laughs> Just don't feel well, I guess. Can I get you an aspirin or something? Well, I don't think an aspirin will help very much. Don't worry, honey, I'll be all right. Now look, there's something wrong. What is it? I think I've got morning sickness. I'm going to have a baby. A baby? You? We better tell somebody. Uh, uh, Carol. Fred, no, it's too soon to tell anyone. Well, too soon, for sure. Uh, uh, oh, gosh, honey. Oh, gee, you're wonderful. <laughs> we both are. <laughs> During the next few months, my routine changed considerably. There was a registering at the Navy Hospital and frequent routine visits there. I noticed that many people showed me extra courtesy. And of course, Carol and the other wives were cheerfully concerned about me. Fred, naturally, was especially attentive and helpful. Fred also had re-enlisted. We talked it over and he decided to sign up for another four years. There was Fred's pride in the Navy and in his job. There was the uncertainty of civilian life. And there was the coming baby. Then suddenly the blow fell. There was no secret this time as to where Fred was going. To Little America, to help set up a base camp which would later be used by a group of scientists on an expedition that was to be known as Operation Deep Freeze. It was more than likely that Fred would be down there when our baby was born. And that was a little frightening. I found it easier if I kept myself busy, useful, and cheerful. That Fred was thousands of miles away was unfortunate. But I was proud of the special work he was doing. The least I could do to keep him from worrying was to show him I could take care of things at home. Just before the baby was born, I received a late, late telephone call. A call that was unofficial Navy, yet very typical Navy. Hello? This is Young, Mrs. Ann Young. Yes, who's this? Jack Tupper here, Mrs. Young. I'm a ham radio operator, and I have a message for you from Operation Deep Freeze at the South Pole. I have Mrs. Young. Go ahead. 
Okay. Here, you take it. Look, um, what if anything happened yet? What kind of a question is that? Look, ask her if it, it has to do with a baby. A baby? Mrs. Young, Fred wants to know if anything has happened. Tell him not yet, but any day now. Look, um, you tell her I love her and I, I wish I was with her. He loves you and he wishes he were with you. Tell him I love him, too. She loves you, too. You know that she loves me, too? For a long time after Tommy was born, it seemed I did nothing but change, wash, and hang out to dry a never-ending stream of diapers. Actually, a lot else happened. A highlight was the baby's christening, attended by Carol and her husband and several other friends. Carol became godmother to Tommy. And to our great pleasure and pride, Fred's division officer became godfather. Another wonderful thing that happened was that Fred, by hard study, some of it while he was at the South Pole, became a petty officer first class. One thing, however, hadn't changed, the car. But it was still running, and it would have to serve us a little longer. For with Fred's increased pay, we decided to buy our own home. There was a feeling of security in the idea of having our own house. It was practical, too. For if Fred were transferred to another station, we could always rent it to another Navy family. We looked at several places, but we especially liked the house in a pleasant nearby suburb. So we bought the house, using Fred's reenlistment bonus we had saved for the down payment and financing it through in-service FHA. For a long time, Carol had been talking about the Navy Wives Club to which she belonged and had urged me to attend a meeting. One day, I got curious and went along. Before the formal meeting, I met and talked with many of the individual members. I was greatly impressed by the backgrounds and interests of these women. They were leaders not only in Navy life, but in the community as well. Mrs. McCloskey was the president of the local PTA. Mrs. Maisel led a Girl Scout troop. Mrs. Wright had organized and taught at a nursery school. Mrs. Benton worked with a group of emotionally disturbed children. I joined the club and have never regretted it. Partly influenced by the Wise Club, I broadened my horizons. With Tommy, I went on many of the club's organized outings. To the local zoo, for example. To the beach. And on excursions to nearby points of interest. I also interested myself in club charity activities. The Wise prepared Layette, for instance, for distribution to new mothers at the hospital. At the same time, officers' wives collected clothes for Navy relief shops and for orphanages in Korea and elsewhere, and served at Navy Relief Society thrift shops. Needless to say, the years that followed brought with them their problems and joys, some of them peculiar to the Navy. Fred was transferred, and for a time, we lived at Alameda, renting our house as we'd planned. Carol and her husband also moved, but had returned recently to San Diego, where they bought a house close by ours. Soon we returned, and our friendship picked up just where it left off. But somehow, friendships never need renewing in the Navy. They're always there, warm, undemanding. Of our problems, there was a time, for instance, when Tommy was five years old. like any normal boy of his age, was either screaming with laughter or mortal pain. Never, it seems, anything in between. The big naval hospital where Tommy was born gave me a feeling of confidence, knowing that in a few minutes he'd be in the hands of competent doctors and nurses. Yes, and knowing, too, that after Tommy was fixed up, we wouldn't have a big medical bill to worry about.
talked to his teen Tommy several times before, and they got along well together. He said Tommy would be all right. He'd need a couple of stitches and a tetanus shot. And they'd taken an x-ray to be certain there was no fracture. Did I want to wait outside while all this was going on? Once, perhaps, I might have been squeamish about staying. But not now. Not after years of being a Navy wife. Tommy needed me. Needed my comfort. I'd stay with Tommy. While they got him ready, I thought about those years. Tommy stood up to the medical treatment like the good little sailor he was. And by evening, he was playing baseball in the backyard with his friends as though nothing had happened. Despite my outside activities, the bulk of my time I devoted to my family and to my home. For, like most Navy wives, I firmly believe that family is the cornerstone, the foundation of the Navy way of life, of the American way of life. If it is strong, it reflects in the well-being and morale of Fred and the other men of the Navy. In whatever corner of the world they are, whether on exercise maneuvers or on policing action to stop communist aggression, their job is made easier by the knowledge that back home is a strong, self-reliant family unit. Yes, it is through family, I know, that the Navy wife dedicates herself to her community, to the Navy, and to her country. The time again came when Fred had to decide about re-enlistment. Hey, honey, where's Tommy? Playing outside. Take him yourself a minute, will you? Look, uh, I've been thinking about shipping over again. Oh, well, so was I. Look, I'm doing good, Ann. I think I can make chief petty officer my next enlistment in the... I was even thinking of going for 20. The only thing is that... Well, look, how do you feel about it? Well, I... Oh, I know you must get lonesome when I'm on sea duty, but... Well, you've got Tommy and our friends, and... Gosh, you know I'm due to draw overseas shore duty pretty soon, and you and Tommy will be able to come with me. Why, well, the Navy pay for the whole thing, and they got... Fred was that really place. selling up a storm. He thought first he might draw Hawaii. He knew I'd love the beach there. As for the breakers, Tommy would soon be riding them in like a fish. Then he thought it might be Japan. A shipmate had told him all about it. There were temples to see and parks to walk in, even a yacht club for the wives, and stateside school for Tommy maintained by the Navy. Next it was that someday we'd get to Europe, maybe France. I'd wander through the quaint streets there, visit the hotels, I stopped him when he began to describe the girl. Maybe I should wish you'd draw duty at the South Pole again. All right, honey, look. The point I'm trying to make is this. Being a Navy wife has its own special problems. Well, I've always thought you kind of took them in stride. You kind of enjoyed it. Well, coping with them. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. You're not wrong. I like your Navy. <laughs> what do you mean, my Navy? It's as much yours as it is mine, but, well, to me, I don't know, I think that it's you and wives like you that give the Navy the heart and backbone that it has. Why, that's one of the nicest things I've heard in a long time. Get your son in here, sailor. Child's ready. Uh -huh. 